Hey everybody, how you doing? It's your boy Shaheener coming at you with another episode of the Pokemon Babblers podcast. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host Bono. Wait, where'd he go? Who? Wait, who? Where's Bono? Uh, I, I don't know. I see a rat, but I don't see Bono. Squeak, squeak. Yeah, I don't know where my friend went. But anyways, <laughs> yeah. So I'm joined. <laughs> I'm joined by Bono. And the reason why I omit the 916 this time is because Bono mm-hmm. is on YouTube. And mm-hmm. he's at Bono. Check him out in the link down below. He's been working really hard on there. I'm really proud of him. Uh, he's been posting videos of shiny hunting on Pokemon Legends Arceus. And he has a lot of videos on there already. Like, his his uh, work ethic is crazy. So, yeah, please check him out. Please show some support. And also, before we get started, I want to say thank you to anybody that checked out the last video on the tier list for Generation 5. Uh, it has a lot more views than normal, which I'm not sure why that is. But I do want to say thank you so much to anybody that checked it out, to anybody that subscribed since then. And I hope that you like what we are putting out in the future. So, yeah, for anybody that's watching, please subscribe. Please support the channel. Uh, let us know what you think. Tell your friends. Because uh, we're having a lot of fun making these videos. Uh, just mm-hmm. having fun making Pokemon-related content for the people out there. So, yeah, uh, Links Bono's to everything are... in the description below. Yeah. So, uh, now, on to the podcast. So, this episode, we are talking about... The first line of Generation 4 games, well, actually, yeah, the main Generation 4 games, we're talking about Pokemon Diamond, we're talking about Pokemon Pearl, and we are talking about Pokemon Platinum a little bit later on, which is the definitive edition, as you'd call it, for these line of games. So, uh, Bono, do you want to... Yeah. Yeah. You want to go ahead? Yeah, so, Gen 4 definitely is a little bit rocky for me, because I didn't actually get Gen 4 immediately as it came out. Same. Most of my Gen 4 experience was through YouTube, which I had just recently discovered in the year 2006. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was announced at a Nintendo press conference in the fourth quarter of 2004, alongside Pokemon Dash, which I believe was, what, the DS game where you, like, scratch the screen to hell, getting yeah. to run? <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. It was like, like an early concept uh, DS game with Pokemon in it. Right, and so Janishi Masuda uh, was quoted saying that he wanted to make the ultimate Pokemon game, which, you know, in a sense, kind of was, depending on how much you like Sinnoh. Mm -hmm. And so it was released in Japan, as always, early September 28th, 2006. The U.S., the year later, in uh, April 22nd, 2007. So it would miss... No, that was in February. Uh, Australia in June 21st, 2007. And then poor, poor Europe... (laughs) in july 27 2007 yeah so Japan yeah had it for almost a whole year before they even got it <laughs> right and that's that so mad yeah i mean i guess like if you were in europe or australia well, it depends on like which part of europe if you were like an english-speaking part of europe i'm pretty sure you could have like bought the game well i don't know what was the infra- what was like the ebay infrastructure in the in the u.s I'm, in 2006 i'm probably sure i'm pretty sure you probably could have bought it but you probably have to have a an ntsc region ds to play it Right. Uh, if you wanted to play it legit, at least. Right. It's not like where it is now, where I can like buy a copy from Japan and then tell my, you know, tell my Switch to play it in English. Yeah. For some reason, Nintendo decided to region lock a lot of their systems in that time, and it's just really frustrating for people that wanted to play like import games or people that mm-hmm. wanted to play the JRPGs that wouldn't get sent over to to uh, the Western countries. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, to pretty much either have like a Japan region or a, like a non your region system and then buy the games you'd have to pay all the import costs from the other countries mm-hmm. and luckily they fixed it later on to where like well not only the games were released on the same days but also they made their system or at least a switch they made it region free so you can like buy them from other countries instead of having to buy mm-hmm. the system or go through other uh other means let's say all right yeah. and i touched upon it in the in the gen 5 episode but this is like the real beginning of when people just started ripping the files from a ds cartridge to the computer Mm -hmm. and just like posting it online and then you know because the games came out in japan like almost a year early compared to everyone else everybody would be like waiting for an english patch to come over Mm -hmm. like you know like a generic somebody went through and translated the entire game and you could play it on your computer this is where that really began and that lasted all the way up until the end of gen 5 because then Mm -hmm. you know Gen 6 was in all languages and released worldwide at the same time. Exactly. And but so, you could tell yeah. from 2000, was it 2006 to 2000, what was the last Gen 5 game, 2011? That was 20, no, 2012, I want to say. Yeah, 2012 was Black and White yes, 2. For almost a good six years, that was like how people got like their access to the Pokemon games early. It was mm-hmm. like, 
you get the ROM, either you play it in full Japanese and, you know, you just try to figure your way through it, or you wait for, like, an English patch that comes, like, four months later that's, like, very rudimentary and very, very broken. Yeah, exactly. But, and you, and you, get, you get your hit of Pokemon. Yeah. So, I am on the same boat as you as that. I didn't get into Gen 4 until way later in it, but that wasn't for the same reason of like or i like i wasn't checking them on youtube or anything so mm. from t so uh basically when i was a kid so i was very much into pokemon like my whole life basically and in 2005 uh so i was in fifth grade and on halloween usually at school like kids could wear their costumes at school and all that kind of stuff so as a kid who loved anime and who loved pokemon and who loved Yu Gi Oh, i decided to dress up as yami yugi to school i had the whole getup. i fucking decked that shit out like i had the hair i had the millennium like the millennium puzzle i had the clothes i had the thing millennium that covered the bling. shoes i had everything like i was like set but uh i was definitely uh the laughing stock of the school that day uh, i think pretty much every single person that i came across laughed at me in some way whether it was faculty students friends anything like that and it killed my self-esteem and it made me hate everything that I loved up until that point. I hated pretty much anything that, like, brought me happiness at that point. Like, Pokemon stuff, Yu-Gi-Oh stuff, Digimon, all of it. I just, like, I destroyed my collections of cards. I got rid of all my games. I hated all of it up until uh, around, like, a week or so that Pokemon Platinum was about to come out. So, and that was in our freshman year. So, at the end of our freshman year was when Platinum was coming out. Because mm -hmm. I remember there was a, there was a kid... It, on the track team, his name was Stan. Like, actually, his name uh, was Stan. Stan? Stan! Stan! I remember he was, like, before the practice started, he brought his DS with him, and he was playing uh, Pokemon Diamond or Pearl. And I was kind of, like, watching him play it. I was like, oh, that looks kind of cool. Like, I hadn't paid any attention to Gen 4 at that point. Like, Gen 3 was the last kind of set of games that I cared about. Or that I paid attention to. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Maybe I should look into it. And then I saw that Platinum was just about to come out. And so uh, the day of release, I walked over. There's a local video game store from down the street from my house. And uh, yeah, shout out to Mark's video. Uh, rest in peace. But uh, yeah, I got my copy of Platinum over there. Uh, I still had my old DS. I still had my, my uh, original DS. And I played it from there. And that just immediately reignited my passion for Pokemon. But that also meant I never got to actually play the original Diamond and Pearl. Uh, I started with Platinum. That was my first. And so mm -hmm. I needed to go back to original Diamond and Pearl. Because I did get a copy from, like, a, like a Sears or something like that. I got a copy of Diamond. I tried playing it, and it was just, like, it was just so slow compared to Platinum that I was, like, I couldn't play it. <laughs> mm. But, uh, anyways, that's enough uh, babbling in that moment. <laughs> I had to jump through a lot of hoops to yeah. get to get to Diamond and Pearl, yeah. So originally the DS came out, and I was like, I need to get a DS because it can play Game Boy games. And then also, this is how corrupted like the the Pokemon franchise has made me, mm -hmm. because I had a Game Boy, not a Game Boy Color, a Game Boy. Yeah. And then I was like, wait a minute, the the Gen two this Crystal game that I bought says Game Boy Color on it, which means I need Game Boy Color. So then I got a Game Boy Color, and then I was mm -hmm. like, oh my god, the D uh, Game Boy Advance came out. I need a Game Boy Advance, and then you know, just it just so happened that the next Pokemon game is on the Game Boy Advance. Mm -hmm. So when the DS came out, I was like, "All right, this is future proofing. I need to get a Nintendo DS because more likely than not, the next Pokemon game is going to be out on the Nintendo DS." Mm -hmm. So I had to basically like manipulate my family members into getting me a Nintendo DS. You could you could say I was born with the ability rat tactics. I mean, <laughs> and so I got one, and then um. I, I, had, I convinced my grandmother to get me one, and she got it. And then I had, like, a streak of not listening to my parents, so my dad broke my original fat blue DS. Ooh, rip. So I was like, damn. Well, he, he made it a, uh, what's it called, a Game Boy Macro, where it's just uh -huh. the bottom screen just works. The top, yeah. screen, the top screen was cracked. Yeah. So I was like, damn it. So then I had to do another ploy to like guilt trip them into getting me a nintendo ds Lite, uh -huh. and then i then i finally got diamond and pearl i believe a couple months after the initial release i want to say like maybe july but mm -hmm. up until that point i was watching um like maryland videos on youtube mm -hmm. of his diamond and uh pearl play or diamond playthrough yeah shout That's out to like, maryland by the way that yeah, is like a consistent an, if, if, source of pokemon information yeah that is like a uh 
an ancient let's play mm -hmm. that i always come back and watch every so now and then just because it was so iconic during that time for me yeah to watch like because i was like oh my god look at look at look at the sprites <laughs> look at look at the kid walking oh my god it looks so real but yeah, yeah. um and I, I was literally there waiting for his episodes to come out like daily like that was yeah. like my first youtube like experience like waiting daily for episodes mm -hmm. and like coming back and checking the channel so yeah that was my that was my experience i think by the time platinum came out um my family restaurant had opened so i actually was able to work for the money mm -hmm. and save up for stuff like that so that from there on from there on out like every game that came out uh hard gold soul silver platinum and etc i was able to just buy my own money mm -hmm. oh nice yeah because uh i remember asking well this was back in like 2004 was when the ds came out and it was just like the one thing i wanted for christmas was a ds so and that was like ds was like the hot seller of the holiday mm -hmm. everybody was sold out like i remember seeing a demo of it at a at a fries and i told me dad mm -hmm. like this is what i want like Rip. i want this but it was so freaking sold out he ended up buying one from ebay uh I don't know if he paid scalper prices. I don't remember. I didn't get a chance to ask him. Not like he would know what the MSRP was, I guess. But uh, yeah, I got it. Mm -hmm. It had the the Metroid Prime Hunters demo, and uh, the only thing, because like I had a Game Boy Advance SP at that point before the DS, and so my parents wanted me to give the SP to my sister, even mm -hmm. though she wasn't going to use it. But mm -hmm. I but the SP had the link cable functionality. When the mm -hmm. when the DS lost it, it had the wireless functionality, but you couldn't trade if you had your Game Boy Advance games. So mm -hmm. I was like, shh, I was like in a crisis. I somehow was able to like, like garner some rat tactics and like keep both of them for myself. Moving forward here, uh, they are getting back to the Pokemon aspect of Pokemon yeah. Gobblers. Uh, we got two new characters. One is iconic in the series. The other one kind of just fell by the wayside. Obviously, mm -hmm. Dawn and Lucas. Dawn went on to be a member of the anime crew, mm -hmm. and her popularity just took off from there, whereas Lucas had one movie appearance and then just fell into obscurity. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you ever really like the Pokemon characters and you like their designs, I would recommend reading the Pokemon Adventures manga. That is just like even the creator um, Satoshi Chidori is like, if I had you know creative reign, like this is what the Pokemon games would be, you know, if they had the technology at the time, make like the story. I feel like I read those like back in high school. I can't really remember, but that is something I want to go back and reread. Is like the whole like Pokemon Adventures manga. Let us know if you want to do yeah. a Pokemon Adventures manga review. Uh, review. Yeah. We yeah, can do a whole sure. arc review. Yeah, we'll do like a, we'll I have do actually, a book club. I've read every single one up until the Gen Five one because I believe that is when they started localizing the volumes. Mm -hmm. Now they localized the volumes way before then, but. Well, for whatever reason, the person that was providing like the raw scans online decided to stop at Gen mm -hmm. 5. Mm -hmm. So I haven't read any of the Gen 5 to Gen 6 to Gen 7 ones. But okay. we could do that. Yeah, no, I'd love to do that. That'd be cool, like a, a Pokemon Babblers book club. Right, but if you ever have the time and you're bored and you're just you're, uh, pining for Pokemon content, the Pokemon Adventures manga is really a nice source, and it has pretty compelling stories. And it just gives life to characters that you've been playing as for years. Yeah. And, you know, just stuff like that. It also has weird takes on the stories. So yeah. there uh, is that, but they're, they're a pleasant read. Yeah, I actually, uh, what was it? How many of them were there? One second. They're not named Don and Lucas, though. And the, and the thing, I believe they're called Dia and Platina. And then I think Barry is something Pearl, but I don't remember. Yeah, so... A couple months ago, uh, from I bought it from I don't know if they have it available, but I bought it online. They had a uh, the volumes one through seven for the Red and Blue Saga. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really cheap, so it's like it has like all of those in there. Yep. And uh, I got it from Sam's Club, I want to say. But um, mm -hmm. you know, I should have got them when I first started at Costco because they had like like the later ones, and I never got around to buying them. I think it was because I was like trying to be like particularly my money and then i just stopped giving shit <laughs> but um mm -hmm. yeah i want to collect all of them like physically i want to have all of them so mm -hmm. um yeah but i really want to go back and read everything but right. yeah lucas and dawn uh dawn was honestly like, out of all the side characters like she was very enjoyable like she was very enjoyable as a side character like she never was like took everything that made may great and just poured mm -hmm. it more into dawn and gave her more development exactly exactly like, which I is kind of weird yeah cause because i love may, may. i love yeah. may 
it, they did the same thing again a rookie trainer who wants a r- rookie girl trainer who wants to do contests but somehow they made her super distinct yeah super distinct from may they even have her and may in a episode together i believe it's like the wallace cup or something like that mm-hmm. and hell even to make it more enticing for people to watch they even had ash compete in the contest and i believe he placed like third or fourth mm-hmm. i mean he's just a little kid yeah but yeah, it was really, that was like a really cool arc of episodes to watch in the Diamond Pearl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't rem. I feel like I I know I watched those ones. It's just like I was breezing through all those episodes like it was nothing. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I remember. What was it? Did didn't May get like a Quilava? Or no 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 got, no that was no, Don. At... Don got a Don yeah. got a Cyndaquil. Right 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 right. Because I remember somebody had a Quilava and I thought that that was the coolest thing ever. But um... Ash's Quilava evolved. Yeah. Towards yeah. the end of, uh, I believe, no, it was like that was in the black and white one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. So, so yeah, so there were 107 new Pokemon introduced in this generation, and uh, where Arceus? I would say that the most of those Pokemon constitute evolutions to prior Pokemon, such as yeah. uh, like the towards the latter half of the Sinnoh yeah. decks, it just becomes evolutions of Pokemon yeah. we've had before, like Magnezone, Weavile, Togekiss, mm-hmm. Probopass. Uh, Tangrowth, Rhyperior, Gliscor, um, yeah. Electivire, Magmortar, and I'm pretty like, the list goes on. Badoo, Rose- Mantike, yeah. uh, Happini, uh, like a lot of it is just like building on to like previous generations, which and, I don't have a problem um, with. No, I don't either, but especially also... since I'm uh, sorry to cut yeah, you off, no, good, especially since um, Professor Rowan is an expert on Pokemon evolution, so it kind of fits the theme of the game that Sinnoh is like the region of evolution, is like of evolution, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense because I was thinking of like maybe this was at the point, at least on the development point, of like they didn't know or they didn't have like mega evolutions and Gigantamax oh, okay, and other form Porygon changes, Z. yeah, Porygon Z, and uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, so it's like they had them as their own Pokedex number. So maybe if they were like, if it was just like Gen Six, maybe they might have been like Mega Evolutions rather than Evolutions. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, there was like there was a notable amount of like new Pokemon, but a lot of them were just building oh, off of previous. Yeah, Gallade was probably one of my favorites in there. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of good ones. There's some that I'm kind of just like whatever about. Yeah, but then also it's like the baby evolutions. Like, I just never got baby evolutions. They're just so weak. And it's just like, yeah, they're cute, but they're just weak. I'd rather have, like, an evolution going forward, like an Electivire, like a Magmortar. Yeah, they also had our starter Pokemon. So those ones were Turtwig, their Chimchar, and their Piplup. Those are the Grass, Fire, and Water starters, respectively. And mm-hmm. those ones would go from Turtwig to Grodel, which were both just pure grass type. And then the final stage, mm-hmm. Torterra, was grass ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, Char- uh, Chimchar went to Monferno, which those ones were both pure fire type. And then Infernape, which was our second uh, line of firefighting final stages. Mm-hmm. But then with Little Pip- did we know. Little did we know. Uh, then we had Piplup. The best. Going into Prin- Prinplup, which are both pure water types. And then Empoleon, which is water steel. Which, it's still a really, really good typing. Like, I mm. feel like that is weaknesses. A lot of them were negated with that uh, with that steel type. And uh, what was your first starter that you picked? Tim Char. This is, like, the, this is still, like, the childhood, like, you know, thing of, like, Charmander's the best. Why would I pick anything else? Yeah. So I just kept picking fire types up until about Gen 5. I think this is when mm. I finally picked Oshawott. Yeah. Uh, I picked Piplup for this one. Uh, I The only time I ever picked a fire starter my first playthrough was in uh i think it was in crystal or the last time at that point like it was crystal version i picked uh cyndaquil Hmm. but um yeah i picked piplup as my first on platinum but i at that point i hadn't picked a grass pokemon as my starter for the first playthrough until like gen 5 like i picked 90 going back to the maryland thing the only reason the another reason why i picked chimchar is because it learned taunt oh and uh i was able to catch abra that way oh nice that makes sense so that's why, because that's what he had on his team. He had a Monferno and an Alakazam. When I was like, "Oh my god, that's like so cool!" Because mm-hmm. it's the only one that learns a move that can stop Abra from like running away. Uh, that makes yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I uh, I feel like I should have chosen Chimchar at some point because Monkey. But mm-hmm. uh, I just I don't know. I was just I think I was 
I was like, oh yeah, we had Torchic, we had a firefighting Pokemon Blaziken, why would I want to pick this? And uh-huh. the other Pokemon were just so enticing that I just kind of went with, I went with Piplup. It just, I don't know, spoke to me a little bit more than Chimchar at that moment. Yeah, I've grown, I have a, grown more of an appreciation for Turtwig over the years. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like how I've had the appreciation for Bulbasaur. Yeah. I'd never pick Bulbasaur over Charmander, but yeah. I definitely pick Turtwig over Chimchar. I feel like that Bulbasaur ended up being like the the challenge choice or like the thinker's choice. Where Charmander and Squirtle are definitely more of like brute force, I feel like, or like picking the favorites. But Bulbasaur is definitely the most underappreciated of the original three. But at least no, Bulbasaur it... is the easy choice though, because yeah. the first two gyms well, it, it's yeah. super effective against. The third gym it resists electricity. The well, fourth gym, you could say, is uh, is okay. Well, yeah, that's true. But also, it's like, it's so, like, that whole Kanto region is so oversaturated with poison types. Like, mm-hmm. poison types and grass types that, like, finding a fire type is a little bit difficult. And you don't really get Would too many water it's toxic? types. It's toxic! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, anyways, continue back to Sinnoh. So, yeah. uh, one thing that they brought back, which was really cool, they brought back the day and night cycle from Generation 2. Now, so, to be fair, they did bring it back in the sense that you see the change of time mm-hmm. in the game. Yeah, There was a clock system in Ruby and Sapphire, but you did not see when it became mm-hmm. night in that game. Exactly. And the main focus for the clock in Ruby and Sapphire was for berries. Was mm-hmm. for growing the berries and knowing real time of when they would grow. But in this, mm-hmm. like you would visually see it, things would change, and also some trainers would be activated at night rather than in the morning. Also, as well as uh, Pokemon encounters. Yeah, Pokemon encounters would also change during the time of day for some of them. Like, not all mm-hmm. of them, but at least a good variation of them. Like, I believe the like the iconic examples on the route after Sand Gem Town is where you'd find Cricketot in the morning. And I exactly. believe the morning times are like from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. Sounds about right. Yeah, and then 8 a.m. to... Uh, I don't know, I think it's like 7... This is when night starts, so, and then I think that. it's like eight o'clock, like eight p.m. But uh, yeah, so they added those back, which was really nice, and that also made it um, easy for you to know when you could evolve Pokemon like Eevee, where mm-hmm. it has to have the time of day. Uh, also, the music changed during the time of day as well. Like there would be a type of music during the daytime in certain areas, and then they would have one that's a little more mellow at night. It wouldn't be as bombastic. Which I thought was awesome. It's like very, very subtle. It's like they had more options to do that with the technology on the DS. Mm-hmm. Is that they had enough storage on the cartridge where they could really expand upon the smaller aspects of that, like changing the music or um, just like just adding more features. They even added a little bit of 3D features in these games mm-hmm. just to add more to like cutscenes or other obstacles or gyms, which mm-hmm. I thought was really cool. Also, since this is the first generation with the dual screens on the DS, uh, so the main focus is going to be on the top screen, but then on the bottom screen you have a certain item called the Poketch, which is kind of like your hub. It's like a like a almost like a, like a PDA or a smartphone where you could change between different applications. If you want to see like the clock, if you want to see like at the Pokemon uh, nursery. A calculator, a yeah. step counter. Exactly. There's a lot of different uh, options with the A Pokemon. drawing pad. Exactly, yeah. They really, uh, yeah, they expanded upon that, which was really cool. And it's nice that they added that. The only gripe that I have about the Diamond and Pearl one is that there's only one button. So you have to cycle through all of them. So if you accidentally miss the one that you're supposed to go to, you have to cycle all the way back through, which they mm-hmm. did fix on Platinum where they gave you a forward and backward button. Yeah, and then for some reason, a BDSP, I mean, I think they're trying to take back from, from the original Diamond and Pearl that they only gave you back one button. Uh, yeah, the Pokéch had fun, uh, like some yeah. really cool ones. It's kind of, I think there was one where you could check um, whether or not the Pokémon would give an egg. Yeah. If you did, if you weren't like completely in depth in how breeding worked, you could like yeah. check your Pokéch to see which ones would give an egg. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe also it actually lets you know when an egg would be at the daycare center. Exactly. So you yeah, could yeah, go yeah. back and check that. There was one to um, check where your berries were, like where you had planted berries at. Mm-hmm. And that would go off. There was also one to like track the roaming Pokemon, but that was like so niche because there's only two of them. Yeah. Um, at least in Diamond and Pearl and Platinum, there's a third. Actually, I think three more. And then uh, the legend, the uh, Canto Birds. Yes. And then I believe 
There's another one that is used for the Poke Radar, which is like counting like how many Pokemon of uh, the same Pokemon you've encountered in a row. There's also one that displays like your team health, so you don't have to check your uh, go to your menu, menu and check. There's also a friendship checker, so that lets you have all friendship evolutions. Mm -hmm. And then I believe that is all like the most useful ones that I can remember. Yeah, uh, they had one about the berries as well, right? Yeah, this is a yeah. berry tracker, so mm -hmm. you it would it would keep track of where you planted them, and then it would mm -hmm. have like a symbol when they're ready to harvest. Exactly. Uh, also, at least on the battling side of it, because that's the main part of these games, I feel like, is that they changed up how the battling system works. Because mm -hmm. at least with, well, let's say, for example, with Gen 3, is mm -hmm. that types, if they are physical or special, were reliant on the actual type of move it was. So, for example, like, a water-type move would always be a special attack, or... Dragon Claw was yeah. a special attack. Yeah, a claw, a physical claw was a special attack. Mm -hmm. But they changed it in here, so now... Leaf Blade was a special attack. <laughs> it's, like, Ghost-type Pokemon were physical attacks. Shadow Ball was, was a, a physical attack. Like, what were they thinking? If I'm channeling uh, my inner AVGN. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... They, yeah, they, they changed it from... Um... Gen 2, which had just the special stat, which encompassed both special attack and special defense. Yep. So then they switched it to Gen 3, where they, they split that up in special and defense special attack. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like I said, types were 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 based on, uh, you know, physical or special based on what they did. So they would use both the attack and special attack separate uh, stats separately. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to utilize the special attack on a Gengar, you'd have to give it stuff like Ice Beam or Thunderbolt or surf mm -hmm. basically non-stab moves yeah non-stab moves which i think makes gen 3 like really interesting i would love if they did a, you know obviously i've said it in almost every fucking video we've done i would love it if they did a battle frontier but i would love for one of the facilities to have the gen 3 battle mechanic oh. i think that that would be so cool and so interesting to see with just the amount of Pokemon that have been released since Gen 3, yeah. what like team how, combinations people would come up with. How they would fare and something like that. That'd be really, really cool. Yeah, I would yeah. love to see like it like it you know, I don't care how they bend the rules, it'll just say there's like an energy field that does it or whatever. Mm -hmm. It doesn't yeah. matter to me. Uh -huh. But I would love to see a facility like that. It is just like one of those challenging things that you have to that is instead of you know you, it's not the let me just push a with earthquake to fucking knock out these pokemon it's something that makes you think and gives you like a challenge and i think it's like a perfect thing to put in there to, for people who want more of a challenge from a pokemon game exactly exactly but now with this game so this is now where they set the standard and they haven't really changed at least this aspect since then mm -hmm. is that with physical and special attacks they're now relegated to the move rather than to the type and yeah, so, so now you finally get moves like Shadow Ball that are special rather than physical. You got Dragon Shadow Claw that's Punch that's physical. Exactly. You got Dragon Claw that's physical. So now they're now they're determined on the move, which actually mm. at first the people that played competitive were upset with that decision, but I think it's just more of like a culture shock where it's like, "Oh, you're changing up our format. Like you've right. basically ruined our competitive teams and now we have to adapt again." But right. Like, getting moves is pretty easy for the Pokemon. Like, getting a proper se team and moveset isn't that bad, honestly. Like, especially with Gen 4, I feel like it was easier. The only right. thing that kind of sucked is, like, going to move tutors. And, like, you have to go to the Battle Frontier and get all this BP to, like, give them moves. But even then, like, that isn't, like, as bad, I feel like. Right. And, and uh, I feel like even with, like, this day and age, like, people are like, oh, it's too hard. You know, like, there's the internet. Like, the, there's a whole mm -hmm. reason, like, millions yeah. of people that, like, would go on a board and be like, hey, what is a team mm -hmm. I can build to, you know, do this? Even with yeah. Gen 3, I'm pretty sure there's still yeah. people that battle in uh, what Pokemon Showdown in the Gen 3 bracket with teams that they have battle, you know, in there. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Because <laughs> if you're like, oh, there's no way. People still battle in Gen 1, which is literally just, like, who can freeze who first right right oh my god freezing was ridiculous back then yeah oh, sh yeah and but anyway yeah they they've done, they did the physical special split and it's been that way ever since and you know we're all the more thankful for it because you know it actually makes sense that shadow punch is a contact move where shadow ball is a uh, is a special move makes no mm -hmm. contact that's also another thing uh, they reworked abilities to where if it, it were st like uh, the example static 
if it does a physical contact with the Pokemon, then it will get paralyzed. Whereas if it doesn't, it won't get paralyzed. So they brought, so they still had the HMs like last time, mm-hmm. but they introduced a couple new ones. Which well, they now, took away yeah. a couple of other ones. Yeah. They took away Dive. Yeah, they took away Dive. They took away Flash. Well, I mean, Flash, I think, is like, it's not an HM anymore. It's a TM, right? Mm-hmm. So but you now, don't ever use it. Exactly. So now they have Defog and they have Rock Climb. Which... Defog, probably one of like the sleeper ones on initial um, initial getting. Mm-hmm. But when it, once you came to competitive and like you realized that Defog also got rid of uh, hazards such as spikes and stealth rocks, Defog immediately went from like... Yeah, oh. Defog went from the HM that you never use to the HM that you can't not put on your team. I didn't know that. Because this is the generation of hazards. Like, yeah. st- when they introduced Stealth Rock in this generation, so Pokemon like Dragonite, Gyarados, Charizard, Zapdos, anything that had the flying or ice, or anything that was weak to rock, immediately got, like, almost a fourth of their HP chopped off coming into battle. So, like, if you went into battle without a Pokemon that wasn't weak to flying, that did no Defog... You, or you didn't have defog in general you, you there was no way to get rid of it unless oh you had rapid gosh. spin but there were only so many pokemon that could learn rapid spin that's crazy yeah so it really you know to, to, to switch the whole battle setup yeah because i remember the memes about stealth rock back in the day about like mm-hmm. charizard and stealth rock was like but yeah i didn't know i did not know that defog helped with those hazards but uh mm-hmm. yeah that'd be uh that'd be something for me to possibly note I'm not is sure. Is Rock Climb yeah. just a normal type HM it, move? I, it I is a like normal is. type move, which is weird. I feel like Rock Climb should have a rock typing. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, the Rock Climb, you don't really get until, like, post-game. Or end of the game, at least. Towards the end of the game. Yeah, because there are certain Cause areas... You need, to, you need yeah. to scale Mount Coronet. Exactly, yeah. So, basically, you'll see, like, these little, like, jagged paths on the side of cliffs, and you can't go up them until you get Rock Climb, which helps you go up them. But it's also a physical damage move, not normal type move, and a lot of Pokemon can learn it, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if it's a tech, if it's a graphical issue because like you need Rock Climb to get like a lot of spare items, right? Like potions, Ultra Balls, Rare Candies, and whatnot. Yeah. But there's only one area you need Defog, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's the area between north of Celestion Town to Celestic Town. And I'm just wondering if they could have incorporated like the Defog in other areas. I mean, I'm or sure like in, in smaller areas to like highlight like a puzzle, kind of like maybe like a strength puzzle, like mm-hmm. uh, you know, like how you would use Flash in the Cave of Origin to like see yeah. everything. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, but also, I mean, I felt like Flash had its place, but I only like that they use it sparingly. Defog just felt like, at least in terms of the overworld, I felt like it was just a, like a worse version of Flash. Like I did not like using Defog, and I'm happy that they only put it in one spot because it just felt like whatever to me i don't know i don't know the the, the I'm, I'm thinking the opposite because you only put you introduced a new hm for one purpose in yeah. the entire game which was so and weird that's that it they only allowed it for one place i mean uh, granted it does have use outside of that in battle but at the mm-hmm. same time it's like you know hms are for those things that you use outside of battle yeah. and there's only one time that you use it yeah which is yeah it's wasted potential but I don't know. I've been indifferent about Defog the whole time, but upon knowing this in battle, I I have a more right. of appreciation of it. I just think it's a flash. I just, yeah. they could. I feel like they could have done a dungeon yeah. that had you those like yeah. filled with fog or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, or something like bog where you just maybe the it. um or Defog the place where Giratina is in Diamond and Pearl. I mm-hmm. think it's a Turnback Cave. I think. Yeah, yeah, Turnback Cave. Yeah, yep. yeah, that would make sense. I have never really delved into this myself because I know how frustrating it was. Maybe you have more insight in it, but uh, the honey trees. Yes. Um, honey trees were a concept that they introduced. That's another thing you could check, as, I think, as a Poké Chap. Um, there are these certain trees in the game that are have yellow leaves instead of green leaves. And basically the way it works is that you buy honey from a vendor. And the, there's a, yeah, there's the Pokemon that you could get from it. Either Apom, Heracross, Burmy, Combi, Cherubi, or Munchlax. And most of these Pokemon are locked to the honey trees. Like, you won't find a wild Burmy... You won't find, well, I'm pretty sure you can't find any of those out in the wild. They have to be done on honey trees. Mm-hmm. And Munchlax is the 1% encounter. And uh, the way it works is uh, it combines your player ID and then what's called a secret ID in your game card for every file that every time you start. And depending on the combination of those two, only three trees in the entire Sinnoh region 
will have a chance of spawning a munchlax mm -hmm. which and is, so and yeah, yeah it's like the chance and then it's one percent right and then i believe it's is it six hours every time you apply honey that you have uh, to 12 wait? hours 12 hours does it say how many trees there are in Sinnoh? um it does not i it believe there's something like oh, i i can't remember exactly i think it's like 20 to 30 um but yeah you start to realize like holy crap 21, 21 honey trees you stupid they're not what's nine plus ten 21 so you, have to, so you have to realize out of the 21 honey trees only three of those can spawn a munch lags that's and so it's crazy. like without without this it's like you're basically trying to solve a problem with half the equation you know your player id but you have no way of knowing what your secret id is mm -hmm. so you have no idea as to which of the honey trees could be a uh, a munchlax tree so yeah. i think it's like a failed gimmick maybe if yeah. it was like an hour or two hours yeah between, that'd be a like, little honey bit more encounters. yeah then maybe i would go for it you'd have to really love whatever is on these to yeah. go and get for it. And let me tell you, Burmy and Cherubi, not, not really that great. Uh, Heracross, Ambipalm, Vespiquen, and Snorlax, pretty good. But, you know, if two out of the six Pokemon that you could possibly get are just duds, yeah, uh, you know, there's not really much of enticing. Exactly. And I feel like it almost reminds me of in the Hoenn uh, Safari Zone, where they had those little shrines where you put the Pokeblock on. The Pokeblock, yeah. Yeah, it reminded me of, like, the Pokeblock, fleet, uh, Pokeblock feeders, mm -hmm. but worse. Right. But now it I, could have been better had they had it uh, less refresh time. I will go out and say this. If you do find a tree that has a Munchlax, and you know for sure, like, where it is... You can actually like um, it's 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 really weird on how it works because Gen Four is weird as well and built mm -hmm. on top of like a cursed burial ground because this game is riddled with bugs. Mm -hmm. um, if you find the tree and you get a Munchlax encounter on the on 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 a separate, you need two DSs for this to work, and mm -hmm. I mean, it, it may not be exactly how this works. So you find it on the one DS, right? Mm -hmm. you, you 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 save before every encounter on the honey tree. You find the Munchlax, right? You're like, oh my god, I found the Munchlax. Okay, you immediately shut off your game. You remove the cartridge from that DS to another DS. And then I believe you can soft reset for a shiny Munchlax on a separate DS. But you have to find and encounter the Munchlax on a separate DS from the one you're going to hunt it on. Weird. I Like I said, Sinnoh and Hoenn were built on top of like some sort of burial ground. And like the, the spirits are displeased with the Pokemon company, and those two games are just riddled with problems. Yeah, it sounds like somebody's smoking a little bit too much crack over there. Like, a little bit too but, yeah. much lax incense. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah, that, there, there is a way to do that, and I actually have seen somebody get the shiny 1% munch lax using that method. Oh my god. I can't imagine how long that would have taken. Uh, I think it was as long as you think. I think it was like an, it was like somewhere between the realm of like five to 8,000. I mean, yeah, that's... A, I mean... Yeah, it has if to you're be if you're shiny be. hunting, those numbers aren't really that much, yeah. but yeah, yeah, it is yeah. like that. But yeah, they but were also, a nice there's gimmick. No but... shiny charm back then either, so no, so it's one in eight thousand one hundred ninety-two. So it, you, you're realistically your hunt could go up to like twenty thousand resets. Yeah, that's so bad. But um, um, like I said, yeah, it is a really niche thing. It could have been bet done better. Uh, unfortunately, it's still not done better in BDSP. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's still just like a mechanic that you really, really have to love those Pokemon in order mm -hmm. to go get them. Right. Also, another thing that they introduced in Generation Four are the swarms. Mm -hmm. So with swarms, so they won't they won't get activated until post game. Basically, mm -hmm. you got to talk to Dawn's little sister in Sand Gem Town, where she'll say like, "I want you to be better than Dawn, so I'm going to tell you when Pokemon are swarming." So she would tell you like, "Oh, a certain Pokemon is going to be on this route." And so you'll mm -hmm. see an influx of that certain Pokemon, which are Pokemon that are from previous generations, or Pokemon that are just hard to find in general. Mm -hmm. So you can find, like, like uh, Spindas, and you can find Pidgey. your, like, Pidgey, Centric. Zizagoon. Exactly, like, that kind of thing. So, Dullum. Yeah. So that was that was pretty cool on there that they introduced that. But I hate they had to go back, like, every single day if you're looking for a certain Pokemon, and... You have to just pray that she has it. Unless you, like, change the date and time on your DS, which probably everybody did, honestly. All right. This yeah. is also one of those games where it was really dependent on which po previous Pokemon games you owned to complete the Pokedex. Mm -hmm. Because while Swarms introduced a bunch of Pokemon that you could catch from previous generations, it wasn't enough to actually, like, complete the Pokedex. 
Mm-hmm. So depending on if you if you own multiple copies of uh, Ruby or Sapphire mm-hmm. or Emerald, then you'd be like locked as the Pokemon you could get at least until 2010. But we'll get there in the next Pokemon episode of exactly. Babylon. Uh, we'll get to there in the next episode of Babblers because we'll little did we know. Yeah, little did we know. But yeah, what was swarms. On the I believe they're on there, and you can pit, you could show what the uh, Pokemon were in swarms. There were a lot of cool ones, and mm-hmm. then there are also a lot of duds. It's kind of just like how it always is. Yeah, so we had it's just like there were some basic Pokemon in there. Like Fampy is cool to have in there. Uh, Absol. Yeah. Uh, let's see. They had Beldum, like you said earlier. Uh, they had Slaykoth to get the Slay King. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's pretty yeah. much it. That's pretty cool. I like I like most of those Pokemon are pretty good, and they definitely added Pidgey in BDSP. There's a lot more in BDSP, I think. Mm-hmm. Or they carry more of the same, but they definitely added a lot more. Also, they or added. at least some. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or no, is that Pidgey right there? Did they just like misplace that? Donde? Uh... Yeah, there's Farfetch. Yeah, there's Pidgey. Yeah. Oh, what the oh, hell? It's, oh no, it's based off of the route number. Oh, okay. Yeah, I so was like, wait, what? Yeah. Okay, so, so they do the route, the and then they do like everything else. Okay. That makes that was sense. Weird. Yeah. I was looking at the list. I was like, wait, don't duo then Zigzagoon. Yeah. Oh my what? Uh, yeah. So another feature that they introduced, um, aside from hordes, was this device called the Pokey Radar, mm. which we have talked about in the BDSP episode. But in this one, it's a little bit more of a savage. <laughs> um, so what it is is the same concept. You run for 50 steps, activate the Pokey Radar, and then four patches of grass will shake depending on like the area you're in. Or how big of the area of the patch of grass you're in. And it's dependent on how far the patch is, how much it shakes, and you can't go to any patches that surround the uh, the outline of the area. And it'll only show you like at maybe like a one and a half second frame of those shakes. Mm-hmm. And then from there, you're left to do it. So it is very brutal because you have to remember where they are avoid any patches in your path as well as you know apply repels and not um not run into any other pokemon along the way but if you do the chain of 40 and then you keep going back and forth your chance of getting it i believe is like one in 99 but the chances of you getting a one in 40 chain perfectly are like five percent yeah it's so frustrating so it's it's better than the normal shiny ch- odds, which in this are one in eight thousand one hundred ninety-two, which is a zero point zero one percent chance. I mean, five percent to a zero point zero one chance mm-hmm. sound pretty good to me. Yeah, but you are it's still accosted. a low percentage in general. Yeah, you're still accosted by a bunch of problems. But if you really like Gen Four and you really like shiny Pokemon, Poke Radar is a perfectly good method. I mean, even like uh, he scrolled through here, some of the Pokemon here are pretty good. Mm-hmm. Slowpoke exactly. definitely one of my favorites. Same. Uh, the Mary Blind. Yeah. Uh, Houndoom, uh, Houndoom. Tyrogue. Smeargle. Le Smear. Ralts. Uh, uh, yeah. Snow. Yeah. yeah. Bravas. Yeah. Swablu. Dusclops. Duskull. Yeah, there are yeah. some good ones in here. There are definitely some good ones for sure. Yeah. I wouldn't but, go for all. I would go for all of them BDSP because it's a lot easier, but I would not go for all of them Diamond and Pearl. Yeah, I would I definitely feel like pick that and choose. If you were to do that, you'd probably have to like have like a phone or something that could record just like a couple seconds and then go back to the video and be like okay this is exactly where they're at like yeah if you want to maximize your your chances of doing that then yeah definitely like record and like roll back footage to see like where it is Mm -hmm. but um you know it's just trial and error it's not gonna you're not gonna get it in a day it may take three days or like a whole you know depending on how much you play like a whole week but you know once you get it you get it Exactly, exactly. But uh, I tried playing the Poke Radar on BDSP, and you know me, I get frustrated very easily. Mm-hmm. So I gave up on it pretty quick. I found two shiny hoot hoot, and I was like, okay, I've I've peaked. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, PSA for that now. Don't go for the forty chain. Go yeah. for a chain of seventeen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then just re- just reset because the odds of you finding a shiny at seventeen are the exact same as of you getting a forty chain. Mm-hmm. It's five. It's it's five yeah. percent. I might be more incentivized to do it then when I just know I could reset at seventeen. But yeah. even then, I got a lot of my plate, so maybe I'll do that in the future. Uh, yeah. So, like I said, I would pick one that you would yeah. like to go for. I mean, you have Pearl, right? Bagon yeah. is its prime candidate. Yeah. Also, you can also uh, you can do the radar for the swarms as well. Yeah. Oh, right. So if there is a swarm of Beldum and you really want Beldum, you could do a Pokey Radar chain because I believe the Ooh. encounter for all the swarms uh, circumvent all regular encounters on the route, 
and it's a 40% chance to encounter a swarm Pokemon. Interesting. So a little less than half. Um, and you like say the Beldum things that went off there, and you just mm-hmm. save and then like you know start hunting for Beldum. Yeah. Also, uh, speaking of like areas where there's hard to find Pokemon, another thing that they brought up just so you can complete your Pokedex even further, the Pokemon Mansion. Mm-hmm. So let's bring that up. So basically, with the Pokemon Mansion, that there is a patch of grass. It's pre- it's predominantly inhabited by Brusilia, uh what is that? Pikachu. Yeah, Pichu, Pikachu, Krikasoon. And there are other Pokemon that you could find based off of uh, they, talking to uh, the the head of the mansion, right? Yeah, they're daily yeah. Uh, Pokemon. Yeah. So you can find a lot of baby Pokemon, a lot of just easy Pokemon to catch, and Chansey. Uh, mm-hmm. And Porygon. Yeah, Porygon. Which you don't have to spend 9,999 coins for. You just catch no. it. But you and gotta wait Pokemon for it to are show also um, can be radar chained. Mm-hmm. However, I believe their encounter rate in the mansion is five percent. Ooh, so that's gonna be a hard. Yeah. So if you get, let's say, you talk to the the mansion owner, and it's the trophy garden where these Pokemon mm-hmm. are hunted. Yeah. It's in his backyard. Um. So let's say you get the Meowth, if and you really want Meowth for whatever reason, you go back there. It's a you you, you save, and it, it'll stay Meowth until I believe you exit the trophy garden. Hmm. so it's not like on a it's not like on a counter like as soon as you get in there like it'll disappear i believe as soon as it's meowth you go there you save and then if you want to just keep hunting till you get meowth you just never leave the trophy guard right until you get it at least Mm -hmm. there's a certain pokemon in here that was pretty difficult to get Mm -hmm. uh it was one that i don't know if people considered a pseudo legendary but it definitely had one with a unique typing and a lack of resistance in terms of like weaknesses. Uh, Spiritomb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Spiritomb oh, is it a ghost arc. Ghost arc, which in this generation had no weaknesses. Uh, basically, there's no fairy type that existed at that point. So it was like mm-hmm. it was like uh, Sableye. Sableye also didn't have a weakness because it was ghost arc. Yeah, but Spiritomb mm-hmm. had more bulk. To exactly, it. exactly. Spiritomb was a lot better, and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The way was... you get it is you get this keystone from a gentleman before uh, Heart Home City, who kind of just like pushes it on you. He's like, just take it. Don't, I don't, you know, take it from me or whatever. And so you get the keystone. You're left with this thing. And then there's like a little thing right below Slacy on town. That's like a pile of rocks that you put it in. Mm-hmm. But in order to get Spirit Tomb to appear there, you have to use the online feature of the underground. And you basically have to go and find, I believe it's 32 people. Yeah, 32. Secret bases and steal mm-hmm. their little flag. And then once you do that, you can come back to the surface and encounter Spirit Tomb, I believe, in a static encounter. Yes, exactly. I think it has to be 32 unique people. I'm not sure if you could just, like, it's do one person. 32 pers- people one DS- there in total. Okay. Maybe you could just do two DSs and try to encounter it with, you know, one at a time. Mm-hmm. So the the Sinnoh Underground is DS wireless, not Wi-Fi. So you need to physically be near another DS. Yeah, good luck finding 32 people. So I think you yeah. can do it with two DSs, because if not, mm. this is pretty crazy. I don't imagine mm. 32 people ever getting together to do this Spirit Tomb thing. And then I believe exactly. from there, if you wanted to hunt it, it's a soft reset. Mm-hmm. Which I think would be cool. I'm actually pretty going to look that up after this episode's over. I'm going to look up a shiny, shiny spirit tomb, tomb gen form. Yeah, yeah, I did get a shiny spirit tomb in Legends, but I mean, I feel like that was kind of an easy one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I found it in a max uh, or a massive mass outbreak. Mm-hmm. Yep. But yeah, let's see from there. Uh, it would be pretty cool to if you're doing like a dream team quest to do that and get get a shiny spirit tomb and then show up to the final battle with Cynthia and be like, "What's up?" Yeah, be like she throws out her spirit tomb and like that's cute, and then you throw yours out and it's just bright blue, ready, mm-hmm. ready to just mess things up. That uh, would be pretty cool. Wait, what Cynthia's team in this game was the side tank? Or you know, we'll get yeah. to, we'll get to it. Never mind. Yeah, I was uh, just saying, what if I do, what if you do like a dream team quest of Cynthia's team? Shiny <laughs> Cynthia team. Shiny Cynthia oh, team. So it's a shiny sick. Lucario, shiny Garchomp, shiny Milo, t- or I think Milo takes Platinum. Honestly, like you could probably skip the shiny Garchomp because it looks no different. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> no. Going from there, since we are talking about the Pokemon Underground, let's get into that very slightly. Uh, let me find the Sinnoh Underground. So basically, very basic. Yeah, this is it's a very basic one. Essentially, you're given this uh like digging equipment from a person in uh what is that in Veilstone? No, Eterna City. Eterna City. Yeah, so basically go down, and there's this whole vast area where 
you could find uh, these shiny, shiny pieces in the wall where you could dig for gems and other rare items like fossils and stones, like evolutionary Evolution stones. Evolution stones, revives, yeah. uh, shards, I believe plates as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, plates, and, there's uh, a lot of items in there. Yeah, you could find all this stuff to oh, the weather rocks mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But that was about it. This is about like the whole functionality of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, the biggest aspect of this was obviously doing the 32 flags for Sparrow Team or getting the fossils to complete your Pokedex. Exactly. I believe you can trade the spheres for some decoration items. It was basically like an extension mm -hmm. of the uh, secret bases. I think the one thing missing from this is the traps in BDSP because the traps yeah. are pretty funny. Right, 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 right. Especially the customality with the secret base. I really feel like they should have just, you know, been able to make a secret base because, like, I, I believe I talk about it in the BDSP episode. Mm -hmm. Um, in Oraz, when they revamped the uh, the secret bases, you could like actually put like NPCs in, to battle in your secret base, mm -hmm. as well as I believe it's like whatever three Pokemon you had at the time that you entered your secret base, you could have mm -hmm. like a you could have like a gym theme. Yeah. Yeah, so I remember you could, like, talk about that for sure. You could track your like secret base into like a gym. I remember I did that mm -hmm. with uh, with stuff like with like fully EV trained Pokemon, and then I also impl they were all level 100, so I implemented a the level thing. So if you wanted to battle me at level 50, you could, but if you wanted to do like the full thing, you could do level 100. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the, yeah, BDSP kind of just got sucked out of that. I, mean, I think they were focused on something else. But in this game, it's very bare bones, very basic. Your really only like drive to come down here is to get the fossils. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so from there, we could go into, uh, well, we did talk about a little, we've been talking about a lot of comparisons from Gen 3. So mm -hmm. one thing that they got rid of were Pokeblocks for like contests and raising contest stats. So they replaced it with Puffins. Were Pokeblocks in yeah. RS? I don't. They were, they were different. They were in there, but they were different. It was a whole it's new. Different. Yeah, it was different. But yes, um, they incorporated a the same a different mini game from the from Ruby and Sapphire where it was a little bit harder because you had to match that little it was like a spinning top and you had to like yeah. match it to your little thing in order to determine how good it was. But in this one, they decided to add like a you know a simple mini game with like stirring and I believe there was like a blowing yeah. mechanic where you like blow into the microphone. Yeah, because they had a microphone feature in the DS for some reason, which yeah. there's another thing that utilized that it wasn't um it wasn't like a like a play mechanic well it was kind of a play mechanic it was with chatot so mm -hmm. it's a normal flying type pokemon it's just one stage and at a move called chatter so mm -hmm. chatter's damage is determinant on how loud you could yell into the microphone like you could put your own like message and stuff in it but the microphone is so shitty that every just sounds like <laughs> yeah. so i think i remember like screeching into the mic and just doing max damage with it. yeah exactly you just re into the mic and it works but, so yeah, yeah poffins essentially replace pokeblocks in order to um increase the pokemon's base uh attribute in the five mm -hmm. contest categories yeah. uh beauty tough cool smart and mm -hmm. cute yep uh they're essentially just muffins or like some for some bread made from berries uh, -huh. uh same thing before each pokemon has like certain tastes they like so certain berries will give off certain tastes like a tomato berry is spicy mm -hmm. and stuff like that it was cool i enjoyed the mini game but i you know like i said contests you really have to be invested in the ribbons or just like have like the role-playing thing in your head about like oh i'm gonna be a battle or and a contest you know kind of thing mm -hmm. kind of just makes me wish that they incorporated like a separate um storyline for mm -hmm. people whether or not the, or like a post game kind of thing like where it depends like at the beginning of the game you're offered a choice as to whether or not you want to do contests or battles yeah and then let's say you start with contests and instead of there being you know five categories that you have to get a match thing there's eight you know eight contests that are held in the cities that are with the gyms and you have to do that battle or maybe a rework of the contest mechanic in general to incorporate maybe a little bit of battling or something like that. Yeah, that would be cool if they added more of that because I feel like they emphasized that in the anime where it's like there was like like battles or like something that was right. a little bit more grandiose. Right. But they I did expand the contest in this generation, but not right. in that way. I feel like it, you know if, if if the Lord came down and said, "Bono, I want you to make the ultimate Pokemon game," 
I would be like, I, I would, I would walk into Pokemon HQ and just like do everything that's on the table that they have for Gen 10. I'd just be like, ah! and just toss it to the floor yeah. and be like, okay, here are the, the things we're going to focus on at the beginning of the game. We're going to focus on the gym story. We're going to focus on the contest story. And then we're going to focus on a battle frontier story. And it's, mm-hmm. I would give each level of detail that they have in like the Delta episode mm-hmm. to each of those things. There would be a major story arc for each separate trainer thing because there's at this point you know we've established what the pokemon world is for Mm -hmm. you know thousands of episodes at this point yeah and we've we've talked that there's you know pokemon contests there's pokemon coordinators or pokemon coordinators pokemon trainers pokemon breeders all that stuff like that and i would try to incorporate a little bit of that story into each of them i would definitely keep the battle frontiers like a post game area Mm -hmm. and then incorporate like some sort of delta story aspect to it like maybe there's like something threatening the grand opening of the battle frontier Mm -hmm. And then you have to do something like that. But I would yeah. focus mainly like on like a dual story, depending on how you do it. And then let's say even if you decide that you want to do the contest, somebody walks up to you and be like, hey, would you like to do the battle challenge and then or the gym challenge from there? And then we would just scale the levels differently, depending on uh, the trainers mm-hmm. or the the gym leaders and the, all that stuff. The battle laboratory where you go through battle all the laboratory. shit. And at the end, you have to battle a uh, level 100, perfect IV, Genesect. No. Yeah. I would Let's also think go. that like, like giving re- like certain Pokemon, like I would say give legendaries out for rewards like that. Like you said, if you if you complete the battle factory, yeah, and you get both symbols from it, I'd say like give like a Genesect or something. That'd be pretty yeah. cool, right? Give yeah, you that. more incentive to actually compete rather than just like the little ticket or whatever they give you. You know, what would be incentive for me to uh, go back to the Battle Frontier hmm. if they had a Battle Frontier. If they had a Battle Frontier. <laughs> Right, that'd be cool. I mean, yeah. like, I mean, in Emerald, the, what was it like six or seven facilities, and then in yeah. uh, Platinum, it's five. Yeah, it's five in Platinum, and uh, Heart Gold Soul Silver had the whole frontier as well, right? Yeah, but it was just yeah. the Platinum one. It was just five. Yeah, but Diamond and Pearl only had the Battle Tower, and that was it. Battle Tower, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. move it's side tangent over. We're moving yeah. Poffins. Poffins. They're basically mu- they're yeah, basically they're muffins. muffins. <laughs> So Amity Square is a place that they added in uh, Heart Home. Yeah. Right. Heart Home City where you could take one of, well, at least in Diamond and Pearl, you take your starter Pokemon with you. And you could walk around this little park and uh, walk I think you can you. only do that in Platinum. I think you can yeah. only take your starter oh. Pokemon in Platinum. I think in, Di- in Diamond and Pearl, it was limited to a, like a select few Pokemon. Oh, I thought uh, Platinum. I thought, oh, never mind. Maybe I got it backwards. But uh, yeah, Amity Square. So at least Diamond and Pearl... Yeah, so there's certain Pokemon that you can take. So Pikachu, Clefairy, Jigglypuff, Psyduck, Torchic, Torchic, uh, Shroomish, Skitty, yeah. Pachirisu, Drifloon, Buneary, and Hapini. So you can yeah. take them, walk around, and you can find certain items, certain rare items, or other things for your uh, for your contests. yeah for your super contests like right. accessories and whatnot. But then so let's let's see here. Realistically, thing. from your go back to the top for the Pokemon uh, that you can take in. Okay, so realistically, at the start of your journey, the only Pokemon that you could actually encounter to go there are Psyduck, Pachirisu, Buneary, Hapini if you hatch the egg, and Drifloon if you wait for a Friday. Mm-hmm. So almost half of the Pokemon are yeah. you know you can take there, and then the other half are locked behind post or maybe post game yeah. or you know the stuff like that yeah and then with platinum they expanded it to where now you could have your starters with you at all full stages too so like first second third are all there with mm-hmm. the other excuse me with the other pokemon that they had as well so mm-hmm. yeah and the, and the stuff that they gave you is all is pretty much the same really yeah it's pretty much no different all right. Yeah. It's funny though. I don't believe they actually tell you which Pokemon you can take in there. They mm-hmm. just tell you your Pokemon's ugly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you kind of just have to infer on a website or just get lucky, I guess. So next up is the replacement for the Safari Zone that they had, the Great Marsh. The Great Marsh is like, how do I put this nicely? Shit. Basically, it's like the Safari Zone, but if the Safari Zone was a cold, desolate place, mainly for the fact that they introduced like the bog mechanic where mm-hmm. you can get stuck in, you know, the mud and then you have to like, you know, tap the D-pad in multiple directions to get out of it. Yeah. 
if there were less like bog Logs. places and more grass patches, uh -huh. I think it'd be fine. Yeah. But the fact that it, it you know, you get stuck in there and the, the selection of Pokemon isn't that great. Yeah. And then it gets expanded after you get the national decks, but even then it's still like not that great. All right. Yeah. Also, so, yeah, and then yeah. there's also Pokemon dependent on kind of like in this. Well, it's not like Safari Zone. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to go to the lookout and look through some binoculars, and then there will be rare Pokemon depending on that time, depending on what you saw. But I believe the rare Pokemon are still like five percent encounters or something like that. Mm -hmm. So even if you like got the rare encounter, like it's like mm -hmm. super hard to get. Right. Also interesting too is that out of all of them, uh, there's Arbok that you could get, but you could only get it if you have Fire Red inserted into the DS as well. So mm -hmm. you have it in the Game Boy Advance cartridge slot, and uh, yeah, everything else. There's no other Pokemon where it's like if you have Leaf, Leaf Green in it or anything. It's just just Arbok. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's yeah. Like I said, it's like the trying to be the Safari Zone, but it's just like it's not so the best. lame. Yeah, it's very, very lame. I only went there, like, a couple times just to complete the, the Pokedex, but it's pretty legit. There are people that do Shiny Hunt in the Great Marsh, but it's not mm -hmm. it's it's not an enjoyable time. Yeah. Let's just say that. Yeah. So At least I seem to think it's not. I didn't bother with it. I wasn't a fan. Uh, but they did, well, more for the aesthetics while you're battling, they added these uh, seals that you could add on your Pokeball, like stickers, so that when you throw them out, they have, like, a... Kind of like fanfare. They made the most. Uh, they made the most. Uh, cru un uh, was it called crucial oversight that they possibly could have. I believe how you can put what up to eight seals on a Pokeball. I think. Let's see. How many can you put? Well, let's put it this yeah. way. It was more than four letters, which was already which was the downfall of this mechanic. Yeah. Is because they introduced the entire alphabet, and you know people are children and would just do profanities on their Pokeballs. And then, mm -hmm. like, you know, I believe this would also transfer to um, online battling. Yep. So, so people would put uh, not-so-nice things on there. Right. Um, yeah, but there were, some, there were some cool seals, but most of them were just 12-year-old kids being stupid. Being 12-year-old kids. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty much all it was. But, um, all right. yeah, but they did fix it in BDSP to where yes, they, they didn't the letters. have letters. They yep. learned their lesson. But that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was yeah. a nice idea. It's kind of yeah. like it. It's kind of a thing that they're like, oh hey, we can do this and not have to make new Pokeballs. Mm -hmm. We could just have we could add effects to the Pokeball. Mm -hmm. I believe it never made it out of Gen Four as a concept, which is kind of lame. Yeah. I would have loved to see like you know like what 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 it would look like now if they kept adding to it. Mm -hmm. Especially another thing people always want is like Pokeball design. Yeah. So like they new would yeah like they could be cool. Yeah, like, they could color their own Pokeballs. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that'd be so cool. Which, you know, I think might be at some point in the future. But mm -hmm. uh, right now, um, it's not. I feel yeah. like, you know, that would have probably set this apart if it did have it. But, mm -hmm. you know, we'll yeah. see that we are where we are. Uh, especially if you could do it to different types of Pokeballs. Like, you could just change the colors on a Great Ball or an Ultra Ball. Or, God mm -hmm. forbid, if they add the Apricorn Balls back. Uh -huh. You could change, like, the color of, like, a Moon Ball or a Friend Ball. Oh, that'd be or cool. Or level ball. Yeah, like a paint like feature that. where you could just, like, draw yeah. over it. But yeah. also, when you have a draw feature, you know what they're going to draw first. Well, I wouldn't say draw. I would just yeah. say change the color. Yeah, it's just like kind of like a Microsoft Paint where it's just like a bucket tool. Right. Yeah, that would be cool. Because if you got a draw feature, then somebody's going to draw a dick on a Pokeball. Right. <laughs> but, uh, so we kind of, like, we barely dabbled on it earlier. But mm -hmm. the DS has Wi-Fi features... So mm -hmm. that added another layer to battling. Instead mm -hmm. of having link ba link cable battling between people, now you can battle wirelessly where you don't have to have a cable and you can now battle online. So that mm -hmm. really expanded like the competitive scene. It also added another thing called the Global Trade Station, which is for like trading with Pokemon or like trading people Pokemon and like did they have wonder trades back then? I think they did, right? No, no. It was just yeah. whatever, um, whatever, was whatever you there. posted for whatever you wanted. Yeah, exactly. And so you got a lot of people offering like a fucking magic cart for level eighty Arceus. Mm -hmm. Pokemon so, that were not obtainable. Yeah, and yeah, with the battling, they also uh, expanded it to the battle frontier. So in the battle tower. There was a certain ta there was a certain area of the battle tower where it was Wi-Fi battles only, 
basically you have to get a streak if you wanted to get the ribbon for it. So now, since the the Wi-Fi functionality has been uh, removed, terminated, terminate, it's been terminated. The only way to get those Wi-Fi ribbons are by using dummy servers. There have been fans that posted like dummy servers for to, so you could use it. Also for like Wi-Fi events for Gen Five, which we didn't really get into, like people would make their own servers so you could still acquire those Pokemon by those means. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's like unfortunately you got the kibosh. And that's kind of just bound to happen with internet-based things. They're not going to pay for the servers the whole time. So it's kind of sad for me, at least, where it's like they have a feature and then they get rid of it when it should have just, like, they should have some kind of workaround, but they didn't. Mm. But the fans found a way because the fans are resilient. And when it comes mm. to nostalgia, when it comes to Pokemon, they will find a way. Yeah, so since it does have the wireless functionality, there were some games there on the Wii that you could connect to. Like, the the Wii allowed you to use the wireless functionality. I don't know if it was, like, Bluetooth or whatever functionality they had with it, but mm -hmm. there were a couple games that were... Uh, one was a WiiWare game, and one was an actual full-fledged game. So, the WiiWare game was My Pokemon Ranch, which mm -hmm. is basically, like, a storage system. It's Pokemon Which Box. I still have. Yeah, and you can get Mew in there, right? I believe so. You have to trade... A thousand Pokemon to my Pokemon Ranch, I believe. Yeah. Sounds about right. Uh, let Some me... inconceivable amount of Pokemon that mm -hmm. you have to put in there, and they have like little models for them, and they're walking around the camp. And each time you hit like a certain mark, uh, she'll trade you a Pokemon, mm -hmm. and it'll expand the camp. Yeah. And yeah, what does it say? Uh, level twenty-two. Um, yeah. Or so. Basically, these Pokemon... So, these are some Pokemon that the main rancher over there, Haley, will trade with you. And mm -hmm. then, uh, at the end of it, so once you uh, have the specific requirements, you could trade her for a Manaphy. But you have to trade up to level 15, import oh, 250 Pokemon. Yeah, or Fion. Yeah, and you have to trade a Leafeon for it. Or you import up to 999 Pokemon, and you trade for an egg, which is a Mew. Or you, tr you trade an egg that you have for a Mew. Which, um, this thing is kind of like helping you try to, um, increase your Pokedex because what happens is she'll have, like, bounties, basically, on Pokemon that she wants you to bring to the ranch. Mm -hmm. And then if you, like, if it's a Krogunk, it'll make your ranch level increase if you can actually find it and manage to bring it to the ranch. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it'll increase the level of the ranch, which increases the maximum Pokemon that are there. And increases, um, like, will determine what she can actually trade you. Exactly. And so, stuff like yeah. that. And you can interact with the Pokemon. It's cool. And people can come by and stuff like that. But, yeah, you'd have to, you know, uh, uh, was it how many Pokemon? A thousand Pokemon you have to, t to put in there? Exactly, yeah. A thousand and Pokemon. And you can only hold six Pokemon at a time, 30 Pokemon in a box. I believe there are 30 boxes. Mm -hmm. It's possible, but you'd have to just spend hours catching yeah. Bidoofs and Starlings. And I'm pretty sure this uh my Pokemon Ranch was only relegated to Diamond and Pearl, but then mm -hmm. Platinum was allowed in the Japanese release. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so in Japan they had a platinum version of it, but we only got the basic version with Diamond and Pearl. So I never used my Pokemon Ranch because I never had Diamond and Pearl. Mm -hmm. Um But there's another game that you could connect wirelessly to, which was uh Pokemon Battle Revolution for the Wii, which was basically like a... Battle Sim. It, basically. Yeah, it's a yeah. Battle Sim, like, knockoff of Stadium. Uh, no mini games though. Yeah, no mini games. But you could wirelessly trade over your team, and you could play your po like a battle on the big screen against somebody else with the wireless functionality as well. You use your DSs at the controllers, which was really cool. Like, I did that once with uh, with Kyle, actually. Like, we did a, mm -hmm. we did a Battle Revolution battle. But, um, yeah, yeah, they, that one was really cool, but I don't yeah. remember what else they had from there. Yeah. Yeah. Battle yeah. Revolution. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, not very yeah. successful Battle Revolution. Yeah. But also you can get a uh, certain Pokemon from there. You can get a special Electivire and Magmortar. That's one thing I did forget. There are codes for them, which mm -hmm. allows you to get them, which you could trade over to your games. But, uh, yeah, they're level 50, Magmortar, and Electivire with a good move set. There is uh, one of the post-game areas, the Pal Park. 
So the pal- this is the functionality that you uh, get your Pokemon from Gen 3 games over to your Gen 4 game. Exactly. Because Gen 3 or Gen 4 has a national dex as well, but mm-hmm. you could only transfer your Pokemon six Pokemon in 24 and in, in 24 hour increments. So at one o'clock on a Wednesday, you'd have to wait till one o'clock on Thursday, and you'd have to go to a separate area. You have to look for them in different areas. So. If you got a Pokemon from the ocean, it's in the ocean. If you got a Pokemon from a lake, it's in the lake. If you got a Pokemon on a mountain, it's in the mountain, and stuff like that. Yeah. It's very limited into what you could do. So you really only transfer over your um, your best Pokemon that you wanted to bring up. Mm-hmm. So you'd really have to love those Pokemon. If you wanted to complete the Pokedex, you were a goddamn maniac and were like, you know, set to a schedule of like transferring everything up mm-hmm. that you possibly could, or at least one, you know, being Noah, transferring one of every species up so you could just breed it in, mm-hmm. um, in Diamond and Pearl. Yep. It's just absurd. They did lift those requirements in the later games. They did fix it with Platinum and the, and the next episode we'll talk about. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, they did fix it with, like, lifting that limitation of, like, six Pokemon per day, which is absolutely stupid. Like, is like I don't know what they were thinking with that. Right. But, um, yeah, they did fix it. But it was kind of annoying that you have to go through this whole, like, song and dance just to get your Pokemon. Where, I don't know, like, like they did it as well with going from Gen 4 to Gen 5, the transfer mm-hmm. tool. Is that, why do they have you go through this whole thing? Just to transfer the Pokemon over. Like, they could have just made it, like, with Pokemon... Like, the Poke Transporter on the 3DS. Or Pokemon Home on the Switch. Where you just... You just load them up. You wait a couple minutes. And then they're there. Like, why do you have to go through this whole game for it? Like, the game is fun. A little bit. But once you're doing it for a trillion different Pokemon, it's just... It's just annoying. It's redundant. So, the next thing. The thing that I probably have learned most recently. And have delved into a lot myself. The new contests in here, the super contests. Mm -hmm. So, in Heart Home City, where they had the Amity Square, you have your new version of the contests, which had been expanded upon from Generation 3. Where in Generation 3, your Pokemon would... They would have a different attribute for their attacks. So, instead of having, like, fire, water, grass, whatever, they'd have the cool, beauty, smart, tough, cute. And so, each Pokemon had that. But now Gen 4, that's only part of the contest. So the first part is a visual portion of it, which you would have to dress up your Pokemon with accessories that you have in a case, which, we, as we talked about in the Amity Square, you get some of the accessories from there. And so you dress up your Pokemon to whatever theme that they have. They'll say, like, it's like, oh, the created. So you have to put, like, items on that are based off of things that, you, like, someone could physically create, like a hat. And then you show them off, and everybody shows off their Pokemon, and you get likes based off of, like, the requirements, or if you're having them that cater to a certain attribute, like the cool, beauty, etc. The next part of it is the audio portion of it, which is a music rhythm game where you go down the line, you're the last person to, like, perform. So, the first Pokemon will go, they play off of, uh like four different colored buttons that are on your touchscreen. So they'll do four moves based off of four buttons in any combination they want, but they have to play it to the music. So they'll set their thing, and then you have to play it to that. Like, it'll show you, like, on a like on a track. So you have to play it accurately to the music based off of what num- uh, color combination they do. And then when it's your turn, you have to set your own combination of four buttons with the four colors... And see if you could possibly throw them off or see if they follow it. So earlier in those ones, they would have it to where the music was slower. And it was in a four count. So it would go like one, two, three, four. So it was easy to follow it. And you could just go based off of that. Then later on, the tempos would get faster. And they would start to do songs in a three. They do it in like a three count instead of a four count. So instead of one, two, three, four, like most pop songs, they would go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So it completely just throws off that. So even then, like, I felt like a lot of time when I was, like, playing it, that it wasn't registering when I would hit them on time. Maybe there was, like, an input lag or something of the sort. But I feel like that I was struggling on that. Being a person who excels at Guitar Hero and Rock Band, that I was failing at freaking Pokemon Super Contests. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
sense. But the third part is more of what we've been accustomed to to Gen 3, which is the battling portion of it. Or the performance, I believe is what they call it. So, uh -huh. instead of catering to one judge, you would have three different judges. And it's not as further expanded upon on this one as it was in the previous generation. Like, a lot of the moves kind of repeat themselves, where like, oh, if you compete, if you, if you do your move first, then you get more points. Or uh, you could stop, like, their, their hype factor going up. Like, a lot of those repeated. And yeah. most of the moves, like, at least base, like, performance that they give you, wouldn't go mm -hmm. past, like, three hearts. Like, it would just kind of go to three hearts and then maybe give you an extra if you did something special. Which, I mean, is fine. And honestly, like, that part, it was, that part was dumbed down. Overall, they mm -hmm. did expand it, which I find fine. I enjoyed going through it. But it really, like, the visual part really didn't matter. I, like, when I played it, I just threw a bunch of shit on my Pokemon. And I feel like that every guy that I look on, most of them really don't care either. They're just throwing a bunch of stuff on the Pokemon, and then they get a bunch of likes for it. So, like, you could pretty much never go wrong on the visual part of it by just throwing stuff on there. But the audio part, I feel like, is where I struggled a bit. And then the performance part, I feel like I got fine when I had the right move sets. But, yeah, you just gotta know, like, the Pokemon that has, like, a certain, like, leaning towards a certain attribute. Like, if you know, like, a Pokemon has more tough moves and use that for that category. Unless you're insane and do a Riven Challenge where you have to make sure that you're, like, well-rounded or at least could go through those ones. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I did find it interesting, but I really, uh, I really delved into that quite a bit there. Uh, last up on our list right now is obviously the story of Diamond and Pearl. So much like every other Pokemon game, you were 10-year-old thwart the, thwart the evil machinations of a uh, grown adult. However, in this one, um, Team Galactic's purposes are kind of vague in the sense that they're looking for types of energy. Mm -hmm. And so you encounter them a couple times, fight a couple of their commanders. However, where it really changes is after the... Um, sixth gym i believe mm -hmm. in cantalave city where you're talking in a library about the ancient lake guardians where a bomb goes off and blows up lake valor mm -hmm. and it actually is like portrayed in the game like a shaking and you guys go outside and they talk about how a bomb has gone off, gone off at lake valor yeah and displaced most of the water and that um team Gal that uh professor roan is worried about the other lakes so he sends Barry to Lake Akiti in the north, uh, mm -hmm. Dawn or Lucas, depending on which your player character is, to Lake. Um, which one is it next to Twin Leaf Town? Verity. Um... It's Akiti, Verity, and Lake Valor. Yeah, oh, so yeah. Lake Verity in by Twin Leaf Town and Lake and sends you to Lake Valor mm -hmm. in by, uh, by Snow Point. Know, yeah, no, not Lake no. Akiti's by Snow Point. Yeah. Lake, it's by Sunny Shore. And yeah, Pascaria. yeah, that's uh, that's Verity, right? That's Valor. Valor, Valor. Okay. Verity's by Twin Leaf. Akiti's yeah. by Snow Point. That's the thing I always never got right is like what lakes or what. So you were you were barred entry to Lake Valor while you were passing by there to go to the fourth gym for mm -hmm. whatever reason they were saying yeah. they were studying a Pokemon, mm -hmm. but now that as you enter it, it actually shows that the the bomb displaced all the water in the lake. The magic and just carp a bunch are of, dying. Yeah, they're just floating magic carps around. There's even like a pile of them, which I thought was hella funny. Yeah, that was depressing. Um, and so you go in and you see that Saturn, I believe it's, uh, yeah, Saturn, the guy with the blue hair. Shit. Is, has already captured and sent uh, Azelf to Galactic HQ or has sent it somewhere else. And then you battle him and he taunts you that the same thing has happened to the other lakes. From there, you go over to Lake Verity, help Dawn out, battle Commander Mars. And then from there, uh, Rowan sends you to go check on the last lake, uh, Lake Akuti mm -hmm. in the north. And I believe you have to travel through Mount Coronet in order to get there. You get there. There's some story with Barry as he loses to the act to the uh, galactic commander there, mm -hmm. uh, Jupiter. I don't believe you battle her. I think she just leaves because she does that. And then you assault um, Galactic HQ mm -hmm. in Veilstone City, and you go yeah. through a whole bunch of uh, stuff to get there, where it is revealed that Cyrus has used the Lake Guardians to create what is called the Red Chain. And using that, he is going to control the box legendary of your game, either Dialga and Palkia, and re -re remake reality to his choosing. Mm -hmm. And so in order to stop the team leader, Cyrus, who you've met like once before in Mount Coronet, and he had some very like just 
bogus fucking like s- speech that he told you. Uh, you travel up Mount Coronet all the way to the very top. You battle the last two commanders, Mars and Jupiter. I don't believe Saturn is there. Mm-hmm. Or Saturn, you battle in the Galactic HQ, and then you battle Mars and Jupiter in a double battle with Barry. Yeah. And then uh, Cyrus summons the Pokemon. It starts doing like some weird like blue and green effect across the pl- across the Sinnoh region. And then I believe you battle Cyrus, beat him, and then go on to capture the uh, the legendary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dialga or Palkia. Dialga or Palkia. And then once that is complete, the entire plot of Team Galactic is moot at that point. I believe mm-hmm. Cyrus just walks away. Yeah, he's just like, I'm not done yet. But yeah, I'm he not just di- done yet. I think he disbands Team Galactic and they just walk away mm-hmm. from all of it. Yeah. But... Which is kind of, you know, climactic, and it gets changed in Platinum to get a little, be a little more dramatic. Yeah. But yeah, it was a pretty cool plot. I mean, it's because we're essentially talking about a Pokemon that can manipulate space or time, mm-hmm. which is pretty crazy. It's a lot. It's like a, it's generally like a step up from, you know, I'm going to cover the world in water or I'm going to make all the world land. Yeah. Or, uh, uh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Messing with Eldritch forces there. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, the 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 plot kind of resolves itself from there on. So yeah. then you go, go back to the gym story, and you go to the eighth gym, which is a very lackluster gym. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we haven't even talked about the gyms yet. Just in general, we haven't talked about any of the gyms. I think the gym leaders are pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, Rourke's cool. Gradini is cool. Malian is it Malian? Yeah, Malian's yeah. cool. Crash mm-hmm. Awake is like one of those like, like ones Crash that Wake. was that was yeah that kind of surprised me on first viewing. Yeah, he's uh, like, Finn, oh yeah. Fatima is meant to be both like a con, like your like a contest and a battler, so it's kind of mm-hmm. like trying to get you to do that uh-huh. by you know the battle story. Exactly. Uh, Byron is Rourke's father. That was a pretty cool idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, Candice is just you know some happy-go-lucky teen in the snow, which is mm-hmm. pretty funny. Mm-hmm. And then Volkner had a little bit of a story, but I just felt like by the eighth yeah. gym we have an electric gym leader. It's not really. Yeah. Is ground you know. or yeah electric is so easily destroyed but also why did he have an octillery on his team was it just to throw you off if you had a ground type yeah that and it has zap cannon mm, that's true yeah so yeah it would really been cool if he had like you know a magnemite or a magneton or a magnezone yeah magnezone would have made sense it's gen 4 like come on right yeah he... but you know it, by that time it's just such a lackluster gym mm-hmm and there's the whole point that, oh, he's depressed because nobody's good enough to battle him. And it's like, I think he should depress for the opposite reason that he's so easily beaten. Yeah. All you need is a ground and a grass type and you're good. Mm-hmm. But um, you do that and then you travel north of Sunny Shore City and you actually get to meet the um, the, the hint of... as to what, yeah, the hint as to what game is coming next. And yeah. uh, there's a gym leader, uh, Jasmine, who gives you the Waterfall HM. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it's pretty much a straight shot to the Pokemon League, where you battle the Elite Four, Aaron, who is a Bug-type trainer, mm-hmm. uh, Bertha, who is a Ground-type trainer and is related to uh, Agatha, yes. the Elite Four member of Kanto, Flint, who is Volkner's best friend and is a Fire-type user, even though he only has two Pokemon. And... That are fire type and Lucian. Lucian. Hey, how you doing, buddy? I really hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, the psychic <laughs> type, Jim. Uh, psychic type elite form member. It's pretty, uh, pretty cool. Nice. Elite four, bug, ground, fire, and psychic. I still can't get over the fact that his name is Lucian. Lucian. And, and for those that are just like out of the know, like all, one of our best friends is named Lucian, who is like the reason why I started streaming. Uh, killer one 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 go check him out on twitch like he's the fucking best i love that man but uh yeah yeah he has a decent team though like honestly all their teams are pretty decent like mm. i don't have any complaints about any of them uh, i do i do i have a complaint about flint's pop, team pop off king uh he has a drift blim and a low and a steelix yeah <laughs> oh yeah that's true if you were gonna pick fire as an elite four member Pick a type that has more than two Pokemon in the goddamn region. There are only yeah. two fu- part fire types in the entire Diamond and Pearl yeah. game. Ponyta and Chimchar. So if you don't pick Chimchar, your only other fire type is a goddamn Ponyta. Yeah. <laughs> That's so pathetic. Fire types get snubbed. Yeah. yeah. In this game, at least. Yeah. It's like they couldn't have put Nummel. I think Camera Up is in the post game. Yeah, they didn't put Camera Up. They didn't put Torkoal or freaking mm-hmm. Magmar, even. Like, Magmortar would have been perfect. Mm-mm. Nope. Uh, nope. 
But then Nothing. we get to the champion, the baddest, dun, 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 the baddest dun, dun, bitch in dun, the dun, land. Dun, dun, dun. Cynthia. Here the piano comes in. Yeah. Oh my god, Cynthia. The, yeah. So... Probably one of my favorite characters in all of Pokemon. Like, mm -hmm. just flat out, she's one of my favorites. She's probably one of the toughest trainers we'll ever battle flat I out. I love how they put the two Gastrodon yeah. models in there. I don't yeah. think she's ever... I, I've never battled her with the West form of Shellos before. Or the East... Yeah, Eastern form. Yeah. Uh, I've only ever fought her with the pink and the yeah, brown one. Yeah, I was going to say that's a very interesting choice. But uh, maybe just a show. Maybe just a show. I don't know. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So, you battle Cynthia. And her, it's a six-on-six -six battle, finally. Mm -hmm. And her team is so freaking tough. She has so much variety. Because, like, the other champion... Like, I feel like with, like, Steven, he had kind of, like, uh, like, a niche of, like, rock-type Pokemon or steel-type Pokemon. Yeah, I, she's the first yeah. uh, Elite Four member that has a a non standard she, she doesn't conform. Well, no, I was gonna say Blue does. Yeah. She, well, she's yeah, and it, like Blue, she has a non standard conformative team. Whereas mm -hmm. Lance was a Dragon trainer. Mm -hmm. uh, Steven and Wallace both had Steel and Water respectively. Yeah. Cynthia has a multi uh, typed team. I believe mm -hmm. Alder does as well. Yeah. N is N is not really even a champion. Yeah. And then Iris is Dragon type. But yeah, yeah. you can see that she has. Um, two pseudos on her team mm -hmm. as well as two bulky as hell water types mm -hmm. uh a bulky ass type pokemon with no weakness and then a roserade exactly wait you said two pseudos do you consider lucario a pseudo i mean the damn thing has fucking physical and special attack up the wazoo i would i never thought about it like that i just thought it was a pokemon that they tried to like hype up like like they did zoroark after it but I mean, it makes I sense. I think Lucario is, a, Lucario is a threat. Yeah, Lucario is a threat. Fighting Steel type, like that is that is a threat, hundred percent. But yeah, once you beat Cynthia, the game is over, and there's no post game content in terms of like Team Galactic. There is an entire area up to the right of Sinnoh that contains the Battle Tower, um, an area that you have to go to get ribbons at the Ribbon Syndicate, as well mm -hmm. as Stark Mountain, which hides one of the uh, secret legendaries, um, Heat Ran. Mm -hmm. Yes. And from there, I believe that's about it for the for the. I think it's called the fight area. Mm -hmm. no. The fight I don't area know what has that little the battle... off. Yeah, the battle tower. Yeah. I don't know what that whole little island is called. The uh, Heat mm -hmm. Ran's one of them. Uh, the Lake Guardians you can go to. I believe you can see an Azel for static encounters, mm -hmm. Mesprits, the roaming. Um, yeah. If you transfer up the Reggie Rock, Ice, and Steel from uh, Ruby and Sapphire, you get Reggie Gigas, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, Giratina is a little bit of a puzzle. Mm -hmm. Cresselia is a roaming Pokemon. The Manaphy and Fion, you can only get, or you can only get the Manaphy from uh, Pokemon Ranger. Shadows of Almia. Mm, right? No, I believe it's the original Pokemon Ranger. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. So you have to beat the original Pokemon Ranger, and then once you do that, you can. Um, I think it's like over. It's like over the wireless feature that you can send it to uh, a regular game. Hmm. And I I have seen. Okay, so it's it's kind of in the same way that it works with um, the Honey Tree. Mm -hmm. So if you beat Ranger and you send the egg over to a game, and then you save that game before you hatch the egg and then you run around and hatch the egg and it's not shiny you reset the game tra trade that egg over to a, a file on another game and then try to hatch the egg on that game and if it's not shiny you have to reset the game that you had it on before trade it to that game run around and do that to see if it's shiny and then have to do that back and forth but every time you trade it it has to be to a brand new file it cannot be a regular file oh my god and that is the only way that you can get shiny Manaphy. And I have seen people who have beaten Ranger five times in order to get five Manaphy eggs to, in order to hatch and then trade them back and forth between those versions. And I've seen it done. That's, oh my god. But that Some is, that is the only, determined. that is the only legal way that you can get shiny Manaphy. My god. That's, uh, that's and then, a whole, whole new level of determination right there. All right. And then Darkrai was an event Pokemon that I yeah. don't believe we got here in the U.S. Or uh, if we did, Darkrai, I didn't get to the event. I don't recall if we got it. Because, I mean, I wasn't going to events at that point. 
I was no, like, and then Arceus, they said it was too complicated, so we never got that. And then Shaman was also never encountered as well. Yeah. Yeah, basically all these ones they pretty much just omitted from us getting, basically. However, you could use the Surf Glitch in the Elite Four, or I believe it's either the Elite Four or the Pokemon League to get the uh, to get to the places where those were. Mm-hmm. It's, I think Shaman was the closest because it's like right next to the Pokemon League. With Dark Ray, you'd have to go across Sinnoh, and then Arceus, I don't believe you could get there with the glitch because you need the yeah. Azure Flute in order to get up mm-hmm. to the top. Exactly. But yeah, those are the three I believe that you couldn't get no matter what because the events were locked behind them. Mm-hmm. That's a shame. That's but other shame. than that, that was the that that was Diamond and Pearl in a nutshell. Overall, mm-hmm. I'd say this is a good Pokemon experience. Not my yeah. favorite Pokemon game to get through. Yeah. Um, I definitely give it like a. 7 out of 10. I was going to say the same exact thing. I'd probably give it like a 7 out of 10. Like, it sets, yeah. the, it sets the groundwork for what would be Platinum. Which, right. I mean, I it feel is like a decent attempt. Things, yeah. But, yeah, like, there's definitely, like, there's definitely the ideas there. There's definitely good things that they could have done. But mm-hmm. there's a lot of room for improvement. But that's mm-hmm. not a bad thing when the groundwork is already pretty decent. Right, when it was their first attempt. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, next up, Pokemon Platinum. So moving on, a year after, uh, actually two years after it was released in Japan, a year after it was released in the U.S., mm-hmm. they announced Pokemon Platinum, which is the definitive edition, kind of like Crystal, Emerald, mm-hmm. and Yellow. Uh, released in Japan, September 13, 2008. In the U.S., the year later, March 22, 2009. Mm-hmm. Australia, May 14, 2009. And poor Europe. This time, not too bad. It was still May 22, 2009. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not as drastic. Not as drastic. Most of it's still the same. Uh, the player characters do have different clothes. I believe uh, Don has a red coat, whereas Lucas has a like blue a, jacket. Yeah, yeah. they have more of like a winter kind of attire to them. Yeah, winter kind of attire, and it looks like some of the region has been snowed on, which is kind of cool, but it doesn't go anywhere else besides that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of new things introduced, like the encounter for your starter. I believe we didn't talk about it, but in Diamond and Pearl, the starter you choose from a box in Battle of Starly... Whereas in Platinum, it, you choose it and then battle Barry right away. Mm-hmm. So you actually, they remove like the chance of having like a shiny Starly. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes shiny resetting for the starters pretty easy because you just have to throw it out and battle against Barry. It's not reset. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the other one, you have to go through a whole dialogue of Professor Rowan talking to Dawn and then you talking to Barry. And then you check the briefcase and then you throw it out against the Starly. I think it went from like a two minute reset or maybe like a three minute reset to like 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Yes, recorder. It kind of was the same thing as the battle record in uh, Emerald version. It records your battles, so then you can replay them mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Also, checking out your uh, like how many battles you've won and lost, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, spin trades is a new thing that they introduced, so everybody would put like a Pokemon on a uh, thing. I believe it is it just for eggs. No, it's just for or eggs. Was... Yeah, it's just for eggs. Yeah, yeah. Everybody so everybody put an would egg. put an egg of whatever the thing, and then the the trade thing would spin them around and everybody would get a random egg from whoever was in the trade mm-hmm. which is kind of cool because i mean there's no actual way of trading eggs but it's right. cool to like kind of get that variety and see like what other people are doing or like right. what other people are shiny hunting or breeding or whatever right they um they did redo the gym order or at least now you can tackle the gyms in a different order a separate mm-hmm. order yeah where the third gym is now Fantima in Heart Home City, and then the fifth gym, I believe, is Crasher Wake in Pastoria now. Exactly. Yeah, and the gyms look a little bit different too, don't they? They do because of the extended Platinum decks. Yeah. So now um, they realize their mistake with the fire type, so they added Houndour and a couple mm-hmm. of other fire type Pokemon available. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of just Ponyta and Chimchar, yeah. as well as a bunch of other new Pokemon, I believe you could pull up the Platinum decks and they could showcase it off there. Yeah. Well, um, whatnot. I believe you could actually get both fossils in Platinum. You aren't restricted to which one you can find. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also now Volkner's team finally has more Electric types instead of Ambipom and Octillery. Yep, that's true. Yeah, they revamped the, some of the gym teams. I believe uh, Candace didn't have a Frost last in her original one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I believe you can also get Rotom a lot earlier in this game than you mm-hmm. did before. Right. It's in the uh, old Chateau, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the old Chateau by Eterna. And you can only go at a certain time at night and go to a mm-hmm. certain TV. Actually, I think in Platinum yeah. it's just at night now. Yeah. Yeah, but... I think on Diamond and Pearl it was on a Tuesday. Hmm. On a Tuesday. 
But yeah, the the Teen Galactic plot is expanded, but most of it stays the same. They mm-hmm. introduce a new character, but he's only relegated to like I believe a scene in Galactic HQ, and then there's a, some post game stuff. The biggest thing they changed was the addition of the um, distortion zone. Yeah, the distortion world. So everything is the same up until the he summon instead of summoning one Pokemon, he summons both Palkia and Dialga, and in that moment. Giratina, as the third of the trio, takes this opportunity to rip a hole open in reality and drag Cyrus inside of it. And then you and Cynthia make the journey in there to go find him. Mm-hmm. The Distortion World, very cool idea, very it cool was concept. So such, cool. Such a shame it hasn't come back. Mm-hmm. But um, you traverse the Distortion World with like with uh, upside down graphics and you know using waterfall, going down a waterfall, the opposite way it's falling. Mm-hmm. And um, you find items and stuff in there, but eventually you get to the end where you battle Cyrus for one last time before battling um, Giratina in its origin Giratina. form. In a, yeah, in its brand new form, the box cover form mm-hmm. and whatnot. So it was really cool there. There's also You also uh, can now catch the Regis in um, Platinum now. You mm-hmm. don't have to tra- transfer them up. And Reggie is now at level one. Yeah, he's at level kinda weird. one. Which still is, contains yeah. the slow start ability, but it's pretty. Mm-hmm. It's pretty funny. Exactly. I don't believe. I think it's uh, catch rate is still like three out of one twenty five. So it's or three out of two hundred fifty five. So it's still like legendary capture rate. So it's very very low. Mm-hmm. Uh, the legendary birds as I said are now roaming in the post game once you get the national decks. Got... Relegated to Stark Mountain now. There's the new characters Sharon and Looker. Looker is the introduction to what is believed to be the Interpol version in the Pokemon world. And Sharon is a scientist that worked at Team Galactic, much like Colress, who was just kind of using Team Galactic for his own means. Mm-hmm. And now that the whole Galactic plot is up and Cyrus has disappeared in the distortion world, Team Galactic kind of falls apart. I believe Sharon convinces Mars in, in to try to look for um, Heat Ran. I don't know why, but I believe they are mm-hmm. trying to find a way to get back into the distortion world to find yeah, Cyrus. Mars and Jupiter. Uh, Mars and Jupiter. Yeah. Try to find a way to get back to Cyrus using Heat Ran. I don't know how they think that's going to work. But you do put a stop to their plans, and you're that's kind of how you can go and catch Heat Ran now, rather than before, mm-hmm. where we're just putting a rock back. It's yep. still putting a rock back, but there is like the addition of catching um, Sharon. I believe you, the looker, apprehends Sharon, and Mars and Jupiter actually get away. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, they did definitely rechange the entire area that's in the top of Sinnoh. So the fight mm-hmm. area now contains the uh, battle, battle frontier. frontier. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, which has five separate facilities. The battle tower, the battle hall, the battle factory, the battle arcade, and the battle castle, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, each of which has their own different things. The battle tower is just how it's always been. Battles after battles. Battle factory is battling with rental Pokemon, so you can never uh, bring your own Pokemon in. The battle castle, you bring your own Pokemon, but I believe you have to use battle, uh, castle points to either heal or look at scout for what their team is or stuff like that. It's all like about management. Mm-hmm. The battle arcade is probably the funnest one where it has like a random effect every battle. So you could have, start your battle with your Pokemon poisoned, paralyzed, asleep, or you can get your team healed or the other opponents can get their team poisoned, paralyzed, or asleep and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, the battle hall, I believe you atta- you battle with one Pokemon against a certain type, so it's just that type. Uh, so if you pick normal, it's just going to be a mixture of normal and whatever types for uh, a certain set of battles in a row and whatnot. But yeah, I be- I like all the trainers, the, like all of the Frontier Brains. Palmer is Barry's father. Uh, I believe it's Thornton is the battle factory. He looks like a very like studious guy. Uh, and no, uh, yeah, Thornton. Yeah, yeah, the Frontier Park. Thornton. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. Dahlia, I believe, is the uh, the leader of the Battle Arcade. Or I think her name is Dahlia. I'm not actually sure how you it pronounce it. It is Dahlia. Dahlia, yeah, yep. she's pretty cool. Caitlin, yeah, is the uh, is the she's not the Frontier Brain, but she's like the princess of the Battle Castle. And Darok or whatever his name is is yeah. the Butler. Exactly. And then the last one, I have no idea what her name is. Uh, I know she's pink haired. Yeah, the battle hall. Uh, Argenta. Argenta, yeah. I would never guess that in a million years. Yeah. But yeah, Argenta. They're all pretty cool. Um, I like them all. And 
the facilities are pretty cool. Like I said, the battle arcade probably has to be my my like uh, my favorite. Mm -hmm. Palmer's a cheating bastard in his second fight. He is. Is that Cresselia, Reggie Gigas, and Heat Man? Mm -hmm. Cheat bastard. At least Dahlia, I believe she has Zapdos. Um, God, I think Zapdos is the only legendary she has. Yeah, yeah Zapdos, Zapdos plays, plays again in Togekiss. Togekiss. Yep. But uh, Duroc yeah. has Entei, Gallade, and Empoleon. That's not bad. Yeah. And then Argenta fights with whatever type yeah, um, exactly. she gets, and then Thornton is a re is rental type, so whatever Pokemon he gets as well. Mm -hmm. They don't have exactly. dedicated teams. Exactly. Yep. I would like if you could fight those two that don't have dedicated teams outside the battle of their facility. Mm -hmm. Just like what kind of team would they have? Like would he have a Porygon Z and like a Foratris and stuff like that? I feel like that would make sense. Yeah. Like you could build teams around them and stuff like that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that just makes sense for him to have more like smart Pokemon and Right. Yeah. So it made going to the fight area like a lot more um enticing going back mm -hmm. to the battle frontier especially with this generation with the physical special split a lot of people got exactly. to flex their muscles using whatever pokemon mm -hmm. exactly they wanted uh, a new addition that they had was the resort area which mm -hmm. was relegated to like a um, the ribbon syndicate it still does but i believe you also now have a house that you can buy which is awesome <laughs> you can buy yes. your own house in the resort area and then for an exorbitant amount of money, you can start decorating it. And then I believe you can get visitors who will come and visit your uh, villa mm -hmm. in the resort area. I think Cynthia shows up. I believe your mom shows up as well. But yeah, it is very expensive on the stuff that you can buy. Uh, yeah, so it says that you could get Rowan, Roar, Gardenia, Maylene. So like all the gym leaders, Barry, mm -hmm. Dawn, Lucas, Mom, Volkner, Volkner and Flint. Uh, Fantina, Crash Away, Candice, Cynthia. So pretty much everybody could show up. Pretty much everybody outside of the Elite Four show up. Yeah, exactly. And then everything is just so freaking expensive. Look how expensive everything is. Like, right. And also with the Ribbon Syndicate, the Ribbons are so freaking expensive from there too. Like the most expensive one is max money. So, and so you have like... to grind against possibly the strongest Elite Four and Champion yeah. combination up to this point in the game. Exactly, or just battling the like the the rich people outside of the Battle Mansion, or not the Battle right. Mansion, the Pokemon Mansion. Uh, like we touched before when we talk about the Pokéetch and Diamond and Pearl, there's an up and down feature, so no Thank longer do you have God. to cycle through everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the last thing that we had jot down is that the Elite Four has a National Dex uh, rematch, so essentially what I call a round two. Yep. Um against them because i believe there's no the, obviously gen one doesn't have round two gen two doesn't have round two gen three didn't have one but fire and leaf green did introduce the concept of a second round with the national dex pokemon mm -hmm. so um here you can see the updated teams for the elite four at least before you rematch them but mm -hmm. you can see flint has a full fire team now yeah right flint has actual fire type pokemon this yeah. time and uh yeah so cynthia's team didn't change at all Lucian stubbed out his Medicham for an Espeon. Mm -hmm. That's smart. That's smart. Good job, Lucian. Proud of you. Mm -hmm. Proud of you, buddy. Uh, right. Yeah, and then we got the post-national dex battles. So these are still five on five on whatever your team is. Mm -hmm. So, but now you can see that they have it expanded. Like you'll see like Sizor showing up and uh, Whiskash. You'll see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait. No, that's the same team. Hold up. Yeah, it's literally the same team. What the fuck? Wait. It's just higher levels then? Yeah, it looks like it's higher levels. Cynthia's oh, team Oh, okay, change. gotcha. So it's like after the National Dex, or after you get the National Dex, then they'll be stronger. It mm. seems like. Yeah, but Cynthia's yeah. Garchomp level 78? Oh, lord. Yeah, so she dished the Gastrodon and got a Togekiss. Mm-hmm. And I believe that's the only change that yeah. she had from her original one. Exactly. But, but uh, they are. I, yeah. I think the uh, what do you call it? The fire red and leaf green one is better because it has like um they like have different Pokemon from the second generation. This one they just get increased levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, pretty much that's that's it for Pokemon Platinum. Uh, yeah. Is there if you were gonna you play have? play Platinum, yeah. if you can't get it, you know, do whatever. You can, do whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, sailing on the high seas, you can to play it. Yeah. It's um, definitely worth a play. I'd say it definitely approves on um. Everything Diamond and Pearl from Diamond that Pearl. everything Diamond and Pearl had. I'd give it an eight out of ten. I can't give it a nine because mm -hmm. it doesn't add much. It is. It, I mean, the Battle yeah. Frontier gets a whole point on its own. I give but it like an eight and a half out of ten. 
I uh, yeah, I'm not, I try to be this whole with whole numbers. I can't do mm-hmm. halves. So yeah, I'll do halves. Eight out, eight out of ten for yeah. me. Um, yeah, that's about it. I, it's not like the other game that we're gonna talk about. That it's probably the ten out of ten. Yeah, uh, we'll leave that for next time. But uh, yeah, I think platinum. It like we said before, it expands on everything that Diamond and Pearl had, and it did everything better. I don't think there was anything that they did that was worse, which is great. Um, I do, I think the one thing that I'll take away, at least from remembering this game, is probably the distortion world. Even though it's, like, a small part of it, like, that, it was just so, like, cool looking, especially on the DS, like, with the graphical limitation they had, they did really well with it. Uh, just everything about it is just really fun, and it's also the game that reignited my passion for Pokemon, and unfortunately now I've gotten too much of it. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I really gotta, like, give appreciation to this game. I gotta give appreciation to to that guy Stan that was playing it at uh, the track field because had I not seen that I don't know if I would have gotten back into Pokemon or at least as soon but uh mm-hmm. yeah that's that's pretty much it for Battlers or at least for this episode so yeah again thanks again for your support through everything that we've been working on uh go ahead and subscribe if you like what you saw uh share this with your friends if like you want to show them more Pokemon content. Uh, also check out Bono's channel. He has been working really hard on it and he has more videos in the pipeline or at least should be. Uh, yeah, we're, uh, that's it. We're out. Bye. Mm-hmm.